everyone, for your grace we thank you, for your love we thank you, for your presence we thank you. Come and be a word in our hearts now, come and touch us, come be with us, show us what an amazing God you are. Draw us once more into your heart, we pray. Jesus, in your name, amen. amen. One of the things I love is pantomimes. <laughs> From being this high, I've always loved a panto. And when I was in the States, it was really difficult trying to get my friends to understand what a pantomime was, because it's quintessentially English. Even when I sat down and showed them a pantomime, they still didn't get it. You've got the dame, who is the worst drag in the world, who's, <laughs> who's the, the main female character in the play, but it's obviously a man. And then you've got the lead, which is a young man, the hero, who invariably is paid, played by a woman. So you've got this kind of cross-gender thing going on. And then you've got the participation. You've got the way that everyone interacts with what's going on the stage. And my favourite part of the panto is when the villain comes on in the background and the villain invariably has a, has a dark goatee and, and dark hair and usually has a cloak and will come on and all the children and me shout out, <laughs> Boo! Hiss! And then as he gets close to the hero, we shout, Behind you! He's behind you! And what will happen is that the hero will turn to the right and of course at which point the villains moved over to the left. And we go, no, no, the other side, the other side. So the hero turns around to the left, at which point <laughs> the villain has moved over to the right. So the hero doesn't see the villain, and there's this feeling of, he's just there, he's just there, he's behind you. And all the children are jumping up and down, and I'm getting excited. And, 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 and they, I remember in America, they sat and watched the DVD, and they just couldn't get it. What is this all... About. You know, life has been a bit of a panto lately. What with the politics here? <laughs> That's a pantomime. And the politics in the States? <laughs> They're learning what a pantomime is now. And, of course, the scary stuff that's been going on. That's a really nasty pantomime. And some days, you'd think it was the end of the world. If you've got a Bible, come with me, please, to Matthew chapter 4. I'm going to look at verses 12 to 17. Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 to 17. It says, Now when Jesus had heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee, and he left Nazareth, and he made his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. So what had been spoken by the prophet might be fulfilled. And the prophet said, Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And those who sat in the shadow of death, for them light has dawned. And from that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Repent! For the kingdom of heaven has come near. What did Jesus mean when he said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near? Did he mean, the end of the world is coming, so you better get your act together? Is he saying, the end is nigh, like folks who wandered around with the placards, the end is nigh, judgment is coming, get on your knees and ask for forgiveness. Or is he saying, Panto style, you've been very naughty boys and girls, and it's time to straighten up. <laughs> Actually, no. He's not saying any of those things. What he's saying is, turn around. That's what the word repent means. God is behind you. Turn around. God is behind you. So we turn, and we look like the hero in the panto, but whichever way we turn, it always seems that God's still behind us. Whichever way we look, God is still there, and we never seem to catch a glimpse, which doesn't seem to make any sense. It's absolutely crazy. But then the prophet Isaiah 
we find, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And when Jesus talks about the kingdom, we see quite clearly that the kingdom of God is nuts. Matthew 13, 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man finds and hides again, and out of joy <laughs> he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. That makes no sense. If you found a treasure in the field, why wouldn't you just take it home? Seriously. Um, and if he hides it again, and then he sells everything he has, he now has nothing at all except a field with a treasure in it, which he's hidden and he's buried. That makes no sense. What's that about? Matthew... 1345, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. It makes no sense. It makes no sense. <laughs> he has no money now because he spent everything that he had on this pearl. So, he has no money he has no clothes, he has no home, he has no food, he has nothing except a pearl. It doesn't make any sense. It just, what, it's nuts. Luke 15, 8 to 10. What woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she's found it, she calls together her friends and neighbours, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that was lost. Again, it makes no sense. I mean, she'd lost a coin. And given if it was denarii, it might have been a day's wages. And I'm very happy for her that she found it. But why would you invite all the neighbours in for a party? Because you found it. She's nuts. Seriously, it doesn't make any sense. And Matthew 25, 32 to 34, the story of the sheep and the goats. The sheep get a reward and the goats are destroyed. Why? The goats are every bit as good as the sheep. They give milk to drink and for cheese. Their meat is every bit as good as sheep. And their skins are used to hold wine and for making tents and multitude of other things. Add to that that the goats can feed on the scraggy land where the sheep won't go. So why do the sheep get it better than the goats? It makes no sense. Luke 15, 1 to 6. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he finds it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbours, saying with him, Rejoice! I have found the sheep that was lost. And the friends and neighbours say, where's the other 99? <laughs> and he goes, uh, they're up on the mountain. And they're like, are you not worried about wolves and bears? Are you not worried about people stealing them? I mean, seriously, what shepherd <laughs> takes one sheep and goes, ah, I've saved one, and leaves the other 99 to fend for themselves? It makes no sense. Except, the 99 sheep have something that the one sheep doesn't. They have each other. And that's why Jesus says in Matthew 18 and in Luke 19, I, keep, I came to seek the lost. Because you're not lost if you're in the middle of a community. You're not lost if you're loved and cared for. You're not lost if there's a place for you and you're respected and you're listened to. You're lost if you've been rejected, abandoned, and consigned to the margins. You're lost if you're a refugee without a home. You're lost if you're a target simply because of the colour of your skin, your religion, your gender, your sexuality. If you're one of the 99, God doesn't come looking for you because you're not lost. God only comes looking for you if you're lost. And Jesus 
sees this. He knows this. And he can see the lost. And he can see God reaching out to them. And he wants to shout, turn around. God's behind you. Right there. Look, you're not abandoned. You're loved. Look, you're not rejected. You're wanted. You're not alone. God is right there. Stop thinking there's something wrong with you. You're God's creation. And as far as God is concerned, you're no different to anyone else, regardless of what some people might say. Seriously. You know, when the Jehovah's Witnesses threw me out, at the time, I really believed that it was God's will. I really did believe that being gay was a sin. And it wasn't as if I'd been thrown out for something that I'd done, although <laughs> I'd done plenty. Um, they threw me out because I was a gay man. And once I was out, I wasn't going back. Not because I didn't believe, but because I knew I couldn't be anything different to what I was. And I didn't want to live life as a hypocrite. I believed that God didn't want anything to do with me. And I never questioned that. It never occurred to me that my beliefs as a Jehovah's Witness might be wrong. I mean, I'd grown up with them. You know, when you'd grown up with something, why would you question it? I, I didn't. There was absolutely no reason for me to go looking for God. And it never, ever, ever occurred to me that God might be looking for me which I think is the problem Zacchaeus had. Here's this little guy with a big passion to see Jesus. But as far as the crowd is concerned, Zacchaeus is an outcast, a sinner. I mean, it says so in the Bible. Leviticus 21.20, someone who's a hunchback or a dwarf is not allowed into God's presence. Being a little person was thought to be a disease. And diseased people were shunned. They certainly weren't allowed into God's presence. So Zacchaeus couldn't get a job in Jewish society and he'd had to make a living working for the Romans. And it looks like he'd done a good job. It looks like he'd done an honest job. I mean, you don't offer to pay 400% compensation to anyone you've defrauded without being very, very sure that you haven't defrauded anybody. Zacchaeus was a good man who was hated because of who he was, just like many people in many places today. And the crowd were not going to let him to the front so that he could see Jesus. So he had to run ahead and climb a tree. Repent, Jesus said, for the kingdom of God has drawn near. Turn around, Jesus said. <laughs> Turn around because God's right behind you right there, tapping you on the shoulder. Why? Because you think that God doesn't want you just the way you are. Because that's what Zacchaeus thought. That's what I thought. Jesus knew that Zacchaeus didn't believe that he was worthy of a place at the table. And so Jesus didn't invite him to the table. <laughs> Jesus took the table to his house. What an honor. Can you imagine all of those in the crowd that had social privilege, those who wanted to show off their houses, who wanted their egos flattered, who wanted Jesus to come to their place so they could say, Jesus came to my place, I had the healer at my place, he honoured me because I'm so important, look at me. Can you imagine the furore this caused? Why is he not at my house? And they'd look at Zacchaeus and say, doesn't Jesus know who he is, what he is? Today, Jesus does the same for us now as he did for Zacchaeus. He came to the middle of our home, our community, and he lays a table. He doesn't ask us to be what we're not. He simply comes to eat with us. <laughs> he calls out and asks if he can come to our home and break bread with us. And that's why this table is here every single week. It's his table right in the middle of our home. Today, Jesus is saying, God is behind you, right behind you. And it doesn't make any sense. We turn one way, 
and we see nothing. We turn the other way and we see nothing. It's like some cosmic joke. It's like those parables. It doesn't make any sense until we stop believing that the shepherd is only interested in the 99 sheep and the pasture that they graze in. Until we stop looking at those places that want us to believe that they have the monopoly on God's love and grace. Until we stop looking out there, we turn around, look to our own home. Look to our own home, our own heart. Because then when we turn around, we find that God's kingdom hasn't only come near, it's in our midst. It's right here in the room. It's the presence of God found in Christ Jesus. And when we come to this table, he is present. When we come to the table, God is present. When we come to the table, we finally understand what all of this means because God was behind us all the time.